It's a show about medicine, now free of ethnic slurs. The guy you just heard is Dr. Christopher Labos. And the other guy is Jonathan Jarry. I'm a doctor, but he's not. Sorry that I did biomedical research instead, jeez. And we're gonna look at the evidence behind medical topics, and the show is Wait, 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 no, I, I wanna say it, I wanna say it. I wanna... No, no, I wanna say it. I'm I wanna say it, I wanna say it. I came up with it, it's the body the of- body of evidence. It's the body of evidence. You totally stole that from Madonna. We are joined by Dr. Brennan McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie is a clinical veterinarian practicing in the uh, used to be smoldering hellscape that is California, but apparently it's getting better now. Uh, he also has a master's degree in epidemiology and another master's in physiology and behavioral biology. And perhaps most importantly for the purpose of our show, uh, he is a science communicator who created the website SkeptVet a science-based pet health online resource. Uh, he has presented at numerous conferences on topics such as medical marijuana in pets, placebos in pets, low-level laser therapy in pets, uh, essentially taking an evidence-based look at bold claims made in the veterinary space. Uh, Brennan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. And see, Chris, I, I found another person who has a master's degree in epidemiology. Yes, there you go. See, it's the greatest thing you could possibly do with your life. It's fantastic. Life changing. I highly, I highly recommend it to everybody. If you're, yeah, if you're looking for a change in your life, uh, go get a master's degree in epidemiology. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I want to start big and then uh, narrow down to specific claims. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, we should start with the obvious question, which is which pet tastes the best? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not what I'm going to answer. That that could be a career ender for me. <laughs> We've never really talked about uh, veterinary medicine on the body of evidence. Uh, we have discussed evidence-based medicine, which uh, took hold of medicine in the 70s and 80s, where doctors are sort of more and more reliant on testing hypotheses and on the scientific data that they generate uh, to influence treatment. It's still not perfect, as I'm sure Chris can attest, yeah, uh, yeah. but it is a move in the right direction. Does veterinary medicine lag behind human medicine in terms of its evidence base? Uh, absolutely, no question about it. Uh, one of the things I've had an opportunity to do is work with a group called the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association. I was president for a while and I'm still involved in their outreach activities. And, and this is a group of veterinarians and bioinformaticists and veterinary library specialists who are all interested in making clinical veterinary medicine more evidence-based. And there are a number of challenges for that, and many of them are the same as the challenges in human medicine. But one of the greatest is the paucity of evidence. Uh, there is, for primarily economic reasons, simply not nearly the quantity and depth of research evidence in the veterinary field as in human medicine. Obviously, society uh, allocates resources on the basis of perceived value, and pet health doesn't have the same perceived value as human health. So uh, if you have, for example, a pharmaceutical company which invests in research for medicines for human diseases and also for veterinary diseases, the difference between the divisions that focus on those two areas is going to be an order of magnitude different, at least. So we often work with smaller studies, with studies that are methodologically less rigorous. We are frequently required to rely on the results of maybe a single clinical trial or even preclinical evidence without an actual clinical trial in naturally occurring disease. So in general, we have to make do with less evidence. And, uh, and I think the evidence-based medicine is still an important and useful strategy for clinical veterinarians. I think learning to think in that way, in that model, um, helps us to do better medicine and to avoid some of the opinion-based and, and non-evidence-based or pseudoscientific strategies that are out there. Um, but we definitely have to work with less evidence and, and make decisions in a practical, pragmatic way, um, even if we don't necessarily have the strength of data we'd like to have. Let, let me play devil's, not play devil's advocate, but let me ask you the question. Why is it insufficient to simply extrapolate from the human trials? Because let's say you need to treat pneumonia in the animal that you want to treat. Uh, you have an antibiotic, you know the antibiotic works and that it treats pneumonia. Is that insufficient in some way for the purposes of your clinical practice in veterinary medicine? 
it is common practice. It's something that we do all the time. We can't afford to ignore this wonderful animal model uh, that we have for our patients because uh, there's a lot of research evidence on, on humans. But even though there's a great deal of, of conserved uh, information in genetics and susceptibility to disease, you know, humans and, and other mammals have a lot of similarities. The bottom line is there are important differences as well. And so what may work or be safe in humans may often not work or not be safe in our uh, patient population. Cats are a classic example of this. As an obligate carnivore and with a natural history of eating primarily prey animals and not plants, they have a very poor ability to metabolize potentially toxic compounds. Their, their liver doesn't do a very good job of detoxifying things. So drugs that are commonly used over the counter medications like Tylenol, for example, in humans with no difficulty at all are highly toxic to cats and, and often deadly. Even subtle little differences. We all are, uh, are uh, one of the things that, that is commonly used in humans in uh, sugarless gums and other kinds of uh, low calorie sweetened products is something called xylitol, which is an artificial sweetener. And as far as we know, has no ill effects in people at all. Unfortunately, um, it is uh, very, very toxic to dogs. It stimulates insulin secretion at tremendous levels and causes an absolutely uh, deadly drop in blood sugar that, that's very difficult to reverse and, and also uh, delayed liver failure. So there are small but often very critical differences between my patients and uh, humans that mean that we cannot just blithely translate the research evidence from people to our patients. Oftentimes it is useful and informative, uh, but we would be better off if we had uh, actual studies in the patients and in naturally occurring disease models in our own uh, species. It's it's funny that for you, uh, humans are the animal model, <laughs> and the clinical trials are done in animals. <laughs> yes, we like to joke about them as being a great animal model, though they're <laughs> often expensive and difficult to manage, and not you know they hard are. to keep. But uh, they're, they're yeah. moody as well. Uh, <laughs> do you, do you have a sense of how open uh, vet, vets are to testing out their beliefs about their practice and changing them in light of new evidence? Because of course. That's sort of the crux of like, well, you want to do evidence-based uh, veterinary medicine, but the people who are practicing it need to be open-minded enough to go, you know what, this thing that I've been doing all my life, now there's good evidence that it was wrong. I need to stop doing that. There's absolutely a culture of opinion-based and authority-based medicine. There's no question about it. Uh, we, we tend, older veterinarians tend to rely very heavily on their own personal clinical experience. Younger veterinarians tend to rely somewhat uncritically on their teachers and mentors and the opinions that they've been taught. Um, I do think that the concepts, the idea of evidence-based medicine has uh, infiltrated the veterinary field. Certainly the terminology is widespread. You can't go to a conference without hearing an evidence-based approach to X. <laughs> so, so there's a recognition that, that there's value in it. Um, and I think that there's unfortunately not yet as much eagerness to adopt new uh, new approaches or to, more importantly, to abandon old approaches as the evidence changes. Um, and some of that's generational. I do think that I teach veterinary students um, a, from a couple of different uh, vet schools, and I do think that the, the newer generation is more sensitive to the importance of, of evidence-based practice um, than, than people my age or older. So I think there is some improvement in that, but there's definitely still too much reliance on uh, personal experience, anecdote, and uh, appeal to authority. Is there a lot of pushback that, okay, well, you did a study in dogs, but how do I know this is true for cats and rabbits and other animals? So is there a lot of inter-animal um, resistance to evidence-based medicine? Like you proved it here, but not in the animal I'm treating? Uh, not really. In fact, kind of the, the problem is the opposite, which is that in the in the absence of much very specific evidence, we are accustomed to extrapolation. And, and one of the mantras they teach you in school is that cats are not small dogs, because there's a tendency for veterinarians to assume whatever they do in dogs, if they're not as familiar with cat medicine, they can just translate that right on over to cats and and even more so in exotic animal species, rabbits and rodents and such that have even less uh, direct clinical research evidence. So the problem is more that um, if there is a single study that shows uh, something is effective or safe in one species, uh, veterinarians are perhaps too quick to jump to using that in other animals without specific evidence. Can you uh, give us an overview of the types of alternative and complementary health interventions that have taken hold 
of the pet world? Because I know you've written about this a lot. Uh, we have tackled so-called alternative medicine on the show in the past. But what many listeners may not know is that these often evidence-free interventions are also used on animals. Yes, you will not find, I think, any of them surprising because the, uh, the genesis for people's interest in and belief in uh, alternative therapies for their pets tends to be their own personal experience with it uh, in their health or anecdotes and, and stories that they hear about its use in humans. So acupuncture, homeopathy, chiropractic, those are by far the most common, I think, that are employ employed uh, with animals as they are uh, often in humans. Um, herbal therapies, uh, Chinese medicine, um, to lesser extent, other herbal traditions like Ayurveda and Western herbal medicine. Um, there's a group of veterinarians who um, have created a uh, veterinary botanical medicine college, which has been trying for quite some while to get um, a recognition as a, as a specialty board, and they haven't succeeded in doing that because they don't have sufficient evidence to justify it. But uh, that's quite popular. So uh, supplements, over-the-counter supplements are ubiquitous. Uh, CBD oil is the hot new thing, and it's kind of taken over from turmeric, which was the hot thing a little while ago, <laughs> which you know took the place of glucosamine. So all of the same things that you know we're familiar with in uh, human medicine are applied to animals, and and some of them have, if anything, less rationale and less plausibility in our, our patients than they do in humans. Uh, the idea of applying chiropractic, for example, to a, a horse or an elephant um, is perhaps even more ridiculous than applying it to humans since the anatomical differences are dramatic and, and obvious. And, and even if the theories were in some sense reasonable for people, um, it wouldn't make sense to assume that, that they apply to quadrupedal animals. So most of the, the things that I encounter are the same, and they generally come from clients having their own personal experiences with these therapies uh, used for themselves or someone they know. The chiropractic in, in animals strikes me as particularly funny because the whole idea is that we, you know, being a, a animal that walks on our hind legs, we have deformed our spine from the classic arc uh, that the spine should be to maintain stability. But of course, if you're a quadrupedal animal, that shouldn't be an issue. So I'm not even sure why, like, it's very clear that four-legged animals do not get lower back pain because they do not have a lower back to put strain on. So, yeah, but, but, but if, if you, if you look at chiropractic, I mean, and, and maybe Brennan, you can, you can let us know if, if, if it's more the vitalistic chiropractors that are active with, with pets, or it's more the quote unquote evidence-based chiropractors, but with the vitalistic model, it's not really about uh, the fact that we used to be quadrupeds and, and now, you know, we have all these issues. It's really this weird notion that there's this divine force that flows through our spine. And, and at some points where there are like weird subluxations, these just weird compressions and all that, that's how we get all of our diseases and illnesses. Uh, so, I mean, Brendan, is, are you seeing a lot of vitalistic chiropractors in that space or is it mostly the, the slightly more quote unquote evidence based ones? Well, most of the chiropractic that's done on animals is done by DCs who are licensed for humans, and, and there's some regulatory and legal issues involved. Uh, it is considered practice of veterinary medicine, so if you don't have a veterinary medical license in your state, in the United States, then um, you have to uh, either work with a veterinarian or you have to be a veterinarian and have some sort of special training. Um, most of the, the chiropractic that's done in my state, in California, is done by chiropractors who work on humans. and. I think many of them would deny a vitalist orientation. They would say that the vertebral subluxation complex is a neuroanatomical phenomenon rather than an expression of innate intelligence or vital essence or whatever uh, mm -hmm. Palmer would have called it. Um, on the other hand, they don't seem bothered by the fact that you can't consistently identify it radiographically or that, right. that there's no consistency between chiropractors. So they would claim that that it's evidence-based, but essentially it's the same practice and, and the same tradition. Is it true that there's an anti-vaccination movement, but against pet vaccines? Unfortunately, it is true. Uh, and it has very much paralleled the, uh, the rise in vaccine denial and, and hesitancy for humans uh, with many of the same kinds of concerns. Uh, certainly, you know, there are a handful of people who will claim that there is a, a veterinary analog to autism that is caused by vaccines. But most of the concerns are, are a little bit more specific to animals. Uh, I had a woman write to me f through my blog the other day um, about an article I wrote 
challenging the notion that rabies vaccine causes aggressive behavior in dogs. There's, there's certainly no evidence for this, and millions of dogs are vaccinated every year, so I think we would see this if it were a real phenomenon. But um, she, she had an experience with her dog being unpleasant to her in some proximity in time to getting a rabies vaccine, so she's convinced that this is a real thing. Um, so the concerns about toxins in vaccines that cause autoimmune diseases or cancers, um, those kinds of things are, are common concerns that, that uh, animal owners have. The notion of too many vaccines overwhelming the immune system is another one that I think translates directly from the human anti-vaccine movement. Um, I think it, it's probably similar in that to some extent, veterinary medicine is analogous to pediatric medicine. You know, people often right. view their pets as children in some sense, as members of the family. And, uh, and so they have similar concerns about vaccinating them and the effects on their health. Many of the diseases we vaccinate for have been well controlled by vaccination. Uh, so distemper and parvovirus and rabies are quite uncommon in my area because they are vaccinated for pretty widely. And that has given people the impression that the vaccines are not necessary. And, and that's similar to the same phenomenon that has happened with measles and whooping cough in California. So I, I think that unfortunately there are pretty direct parallels in the anti-vaccine movements there. How, how exactly does one diagnose autism in dogs then? Well, interesting, there, there is a researcher, and I forgot his name at the moment, who has done some work with uh, what he thinks might be an animal model for autism. And, and obviously, you know, because our patients are never verbal, the, that's not a criterion. But there are some behavioral criteria that, that he would argue and some genetic markers that he would argue might make uh, this phenomenon or syndrome that he's identified in a certain breed of dogs uh, a potential model for autism in humans. Um, he's very clear that that has absolutely nothing to do with vaccination. Um, but the fact that this has been reported on and discussed in the literature has been seized on, I think, by anti-vaxxers to say um, that, that this could potentially be a problem in our pets as well. It's a pretty small fraction. Uh, it's not one of the major concerns. Do you have a dog? I what... do, yes. Brody is uh, is sad to be denied <laughs> access to my office. Uh, uh, no, that's okay. Oh, you can invite him in if you want. He might have something to say about this whole process. From he, does, he does occasionally have notes when I give interviews. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Brody. How are you? <laughs> He's going to find me boring within a few moments and wander off. <laughs> that's okay. And do you have you developed any sort of tips or techniques uh, when you are talking to pet owners uh, who may be vaccine hesitant for their pets? I, I didn't think that I would be using the phrase vaccine hesitant in the context of, of veterinary care. But um, how do you talk to um, uh, pet owners who, who are reluctant to get their pet vaccinated or, or who may have questions about, you know, these, these sorts of pseudoscientific interventions who may you know, feel perhaps slighted if you criticize them. Well, and and I'm sure as you know, as a professional science communicator, you're you're probably more familiar with the theory and the methodology in this area. But as a clinician, I, I feel like I've learned over time that that effective communication on controversy like this requires a, a few basic foundations. One is you have to acknowledge and and accept their concern as legitimate. Um, if you begin with mockery or, or offhand condemnation, um, you're not going to communicate effectively. Uh, being a clinician in general is about establishing a relationship with a client uh, that involves trust. They have they have to see you as someone whose advice is meaningful and who shares their goals. So when I have someone who's who's concerned about adverse effects of vaccination in their pet. I start by saying, yes, I, I understand that concern. You know, we're doing this intervention in a healthy animal, so we have to be very, very careful that the risks are outweighed by the benefits, um, and, and we should talk about what those risks and what those benefits are. And, you know, I make sure that I understand what's out there in the zeitgeist, what kinds of concerns people have, and that I know what evidence there is, if any, um, to address those concerns. I think people take you more seriously as a source of information if you are familiar with the arguments that they've heard, even if uh, ultimately you disagree with them. 
So I make sure people understand that I have their pet's best interest at heart, that I take their concerns seriously, that I'm familiar with the issues and the arguments that they're raising. And then I try to offer them my perspective uh, based on the evidence. Uh, and I make it clear to people that I've put time and energy into finding that evidence and understanding it. Um, I do often also uh, bring my personal experiences. Anecdotes aren't probative, but they're very useful as illustrations, and they do have a, a psychological value in persuading people. So I can certainly talk to people about cases of infectious diseases that I've seen in pets who were not vaccinated and how you know sad and awful that is. And I think that sometimes helps to influence people's decision making. So there are a lot of strategies, but, uh, but I think they're probably very similar to what physicians employ when they're talking to parents. I can imagine that at least one of the issues uh, with veterinary medicine is, is cost, right? Because, and again, I, I'm taking this from the perspective of, you know, here in Canada, um, everyone's covered by, by Medicare. So when you're trying to tell people to get vaccinated, it's essentially free. Some vaccines you have to pay for, but the routine childhood immunizations are, are free. So I can imagine that if you're trying to convince somebody to vaccinate their pet and you're like, and by the way, that'll be $400, is there a pushback just based on that, like sort of skepticism, at least, you know, I use the word loosely, but skepticism on the part of the consumer that maybe these vaccines aren't that necessary and that maybe the money is too high for this particular intervention? Is that something that, that, that tends to come up? Cost is absolutely a significant problem in access to veterinary care because it is a fee-for-service industry. Um, I'm not sure that it's tied necessarily to vaccine rejection or, or, or refusal in the sense that, unfortunately, a very high proportion of pets in the United States don't get adequate medical care at all for cost reasons. And um, there are efforts to reach out to them to provide base level care and vaccination, as well as neutering are, are the key components of that. So there are a lot of, of government and private organizations that make an effort to make those levels of care uh, accessible to people. And generally, if people are, are not vaccinating because they can't afford it, um, they're not rejecting the vaccine out of any anxiety or, or ideological perspective. So usually it's possible to make that available. Vaccines are pretty inexpensive in the veterinary field. Um, you know, certainly most of them have been around for, for decades. Um, even at my practice, which serves a fairly affluent clientele and which is probably more expensive than practices in a lot of the country, um, vaccines, you know, you'd be very rare to find a vaccine over 20 or $30 probably. It's, it's not something that, that's a high cost item. So that doesn't come into play so much with vaccination um, as it does with just general access to veterinary care. Um, unfortunately, we do have the phenomenon of economic euthanasia in veterinary medicine, where we have patients who are euthanized when they have treatable diseases because their owners can't afford the treatment. Um, and that's a, an entirely separate but very disturbing problem in our industry. Um, but I don't think it plays a role in vaccines that much. I, I'd like to talk about placebos, uh, because that's the, the last refuge of the alternative health gurus. Um, it, it's very fashionable to claim that their interventions, which typically work no better than placebo arms and trials, uh, that they work through the placebo effect. Um, and and it, is, it is my hope one day to do an entire special episode on the, on the placebo effects, because I think that they are badly misunderstood. You've actually published about this, uh, Placebos for Pets. What's going on with the placebo effect in animals, and, and what is a caregiver placebo effect? Yeah, the placebo effect is an interesting phenomenon in general, and, and as you know, I'm sure it's, it's a variety of different effects and responses to treatment or apparent responses to treatment um, that come from different things like natural history of the disease, regression to the mean, psychological or expectancy, all kinds of different phenomenons that are all sort of lumped together under placebo, but probably need to be teased out to really understand it. Um, the one thing that most people think they know about the placebo effect is that it is a mind over matter kind of phenomenon where yep. if you believe something will work for you, then you will truly get better. Um, I think that's in most cases not true in humans, but it's clearly not an issue in my patients because they don't have the cognitive capacity to have beliefs and expectations about their illness or the treatment they receive. So people's idea that veterinary patients aren't susceptible to placebo effects mostly comes from this mistaken notion that these effects are, are about mind over matter and entirely about belief. However, placebo effects are routinely demonstrated in clinical trials involving veterinary patients. Um, and there are a number of different ways in which patients who are on placebo improve or appear to improve 
um, that are considered placebo effects, but have nothing to do with belief or expectancy. Um, some of these are simply artifacts of participating in a clinical trial. Uh, there is a series of studies looking at epilepsy therapies for dogs, and they found that dogs on placebo have fewer seizures than, than they did before they were involved in the clinical trial. And that probably has more to do with being better monitored, with their owners being more compliant with existing treatment, with the better care in general they're getting as members of a, of a clinical trial population than it does with any effect of the placebo directly. Um, the other one that you alluded to is the caregiver placebo effect. Most of the time, my patients can't tell me how they feel or, or can't indicate how they're responding to a therapy. So my assessment of their response to that therapy is indirect through the owner's report. If I have a dog with arthritis and I send them home with a non anti-inflammatory drug, the dog doesn't come back and tell me they feel better. The owner comes back and says, yeah, he feels a lot better. <laughs> What we've discovered in clinical trials is that owners and also veterinarians and, and investigators are very likely to see improvement where there is none. If you ask them to fill out a, a visual analog score or some kind of, of subjective assessment instrument looking at the effect of a pain medication, veterinarians and owners will often identify significant improvement in dogs who are on placebo. But if you run the dogs across a, a device that measures their weight bearing on an arthritic limb, there's no improvement at all. So objective measures often show us that the placebo is not having an effect, but we perceive there to be one. And that's a real problem for those of us in clinical practice, particularly when it comes to alternative therapies. Um, a story that I mentioned in my book, which made really a very deep impression on me, was a woman who brought her Rottweiler with osteosarcoma, a very painful bone tumor, to see me. And she had been seeing a Chinese medicine vet and doing a lot of alternative therapies, homeopathy, acupuncture. She wasn't a fan of science-based medicine, but she was getting desperate because her dog was nearing the end. And she thought she would come to me just in case there was something I could offer her. And the kinds of conventional therapies available, surgery, radiation, are not especially effective and are not the sort of thing that, that she would have been uh, willing to try anyway. But I did feel at least like I could offer the dog some pain relief because he was clearly painful. He wouldn't use the limb. He would cry when you touched it. And when I suggested that we might try some analgesic medications, the woman was kind of surprised and then offended because she was treating her pet with acupuncture and homeopathy for pain. And she felt convinced that she had complete control over his discomfort. Hmm. Um, so that was a sort of instance of a caregiver placebo effect that I think has real implications for the welfare of our patients. If we believe they're better and they really aren't, um, then we're perpetuating suffering unnecessarily. All right, we have a bunch of specific questions uh, relating to cats and dogs. And l let's imagine that Chris and I have very recklessly uh, bought a cat and a dog with money that we get on Patreon. I don't, I don't know why you're saying that would be reckless. That seems completely reasonable to me. An unspeakable faux pas. And, uh, but now we have you know these living, breathing mascots for the show. Uh, our cat is called uh, Little Ms. Whiskers. And our dog is called Mr. Good Boy, uh, for obvious reasons. So if my first question is, should we feed Mr. Good Boy a raw food diet? Because I see this a lot. Uh, I mean, Chris and I, uh, we, we look at a lot of dogs on Instagram because they're adorable. Yeah. And there's one in particular uh, who, who's adorable, but she's being fed this raw food diet. And each time I see this, I'm like, ooh, I don't know how I feel about this. Well, I mean, I guess the rationale behind it is dogs are just domesticated wolves. And if they were right. wolves, they would be eating, you know, raw meat from hunting the deer and whatnot. So yeah. does that make yes, any the, sense? The, the rationale for raw diets is a classic example of the appeal to nature fallacy, um, which fails on a variety of levels. One is that um, wild animals don't eat the perfect diet optimized for their long-term health. They eat what they're able to get. And, yeah. you know, if you look at wild carnivores, they suffer from malnutrition and parasitism and fractured teeth and all kinds of, of negative health effects from the diet that they have available. So the idea that natural must be good and healthy is a problem in and of itself. But as you suggested, the idea that dogs are simply wolves and should be eating whatever wolves are eating um, is pretty clearly not true as well. It seems obvious if you imagine in your mind a, a herd of pugs or Welsh corgis taking down and savaging an elk or something like that. It's pretty hard to imagine. Um, they are I, obviously... I, I, I think they just lack the proper motivation. 
Yes. Probably that's true. Yeah. Um, but they also <laughs> have been the uh, victims, if you will, of pretty intensive artificial selection by humans. And, uh, and they've strayed quite a bit from their canine ancestors. In more subtle ways, there's, there's pretty good scientific evidence that their dentition and their digestive enzymes and their GI tract and, and other aspects of their physiology related to nutrition are quite different from wolves. So even if there were some truth to the notion that raw diets were better for wolves, which they don't appear to be, um, it would not make sense to just extrapolate that to pets. The bottom line is that there isn't any evidence to support any health benefits from raw diets. The, the fundamental theory behind it doesn't hold much water. Unfortunately, there is a significant amount of evidence that there are dangers to raw diets. Um, we cook our food for a reason, and that's that, that raw food, in particular raw meat, is a wonderful source of uh, infectious disease organisms and parasites. And the same is true for our, our dogs and cats. They don't have any magical resistance to these things. So there are certainly cases of, of pets being sickened by infectious diseases in uncooked meat. And there are cases of owners, particularly owners with uh, conditions or medications that suppress their immune system, falling victim to the same organisms indirectly through exposure to the raw pet food or to their pets. So uh, at this point, I think it's a pretty strong recommendation not to feed raw food to your dogs or cats. If we, if we have competent visual artists listening to this, I want to see a herd of Pomeranians taking down an elk. Please get on your computers, make that happen. Um, for what it's worth, uh, I will support this with my end of one study. My dog, uh, when I was growing up, he would only eat food if we cooked it and uh, if we cooked it and prepared it for him. Like he wouldn't just eat plain food you have to cook it and add sauce to it otherwise he would just sort of look at you and refuse to eat it so well, he was a fussy he, eater to be fair he, would, he no he had a discerning palate he liked certain things and that's what he wanted for dinner and if you made him anything else he would look at you like this this is not this is not what i eat go back and fix it well and and a, and sort of the reverse of that argument which i hear quite often is that um dogs or cats have some mystical sense of what is good for them or what their body needs. And mm. you know, they will seek out the food uh, that's uh, in their best health interest. There's even a, um, a concept, zoopharmacognosy, which says that wild animals medicate themselves and they select plants with certain medicinal values. Right. I've, I've heard about this. I didn't know that it had a word. Yes. And, um, and I, I find apart from the, the, the limited evidence for that theory, I find it difficult to, um, hold on to when I'm pulling car batteries and underwear and socks and all manner of non-nutritious <laughs> items out of dogs and cats. Um, I think it's pretty clear that they do not have an innate sense of what is healthy or good for them. That, that, that is true because my dog would eat grass, throw up, and then eat more grass. So yes. he clearly would do whatever. Mine as well. What's, what's a balanced diet for Mr. Good Boy? So uh, the fact is that we have a good deal of information about the nutrient requirements of dogs and cats. And uh, there are a lot of commercial diets that meet those basic nutrient needs. I do think that there's a fair question out there, which is our packaged commercial foods, which obviously are... are designed the way they are for reasons that are driven largely by economics and, and commercial motives and uh, efficiency and convenience, are those necessarily the optimal food for dogs and cats? Um, people tend to associate dog food in a bag with potato chips in a bag and assume that they're both processed and in some sense artificial and unhealthy. And that's a little bit of a misconception because... You know, Potato chips are designed to be appealing and not nutritious, and dog foods are designed with pretty good research information to suggest that they have uh, nutrient value. I don't think it's entirely unreasonable to ask whether fresh food diets might be healthier in the long run, or there are alternatives uh, the, to commercial diets that might be healthier, but there isn't yet any real evidence to support that, and most of the diets that are provided as alternatives to commercial pet food um, have some pretty significant limitations. Uh, they're often uh, nutritionally unbalanced or incomplete, and they often involve pretty random haphazard things. Uh, like coconut oil was popular for a while, and, and mm -hmm. obviously raw diets or bones. So I think at this point, the safest thing to feed Mr. Good Boy um, would be a reputable commercial diet, either in canned or dry form, from a company that uh, has board certified veterinary nutritionists involved in its formulation. Um, there are a couple of companies now providing fresh food diets, not raw cooked, but, but still not uh, 
what are called uh, extruded diets, pelleted or commercial kibble diets. Um, and there are, are, you know, nutritionists involved in making sure that those are balanced and, and f- nutritionally complete. So I don't think those are unreasonable. They're pretty expensive, so they're not available to everybody. And I'm not sure there's any evidence that they're healthier, but those are an alternative option as well. Does the same hold for uh, our little Ms. Whiskers? It does. Um, I think it is fair to acknowledge that while dogs have been eating our leftovers for thousands of years, and this has had an impact on their nutritional needs and digestive physiology, cats are still pretty much obligate carnivores. However, once again, that doesn't necessarily mean that eating what they would catch and eat for themselves is the best for them. Uh, One of my favorite studies uh, speaking to this issue was done at the University of California, Davis, where they tried to test the idea that a whole prey diet would be healthier than a commercial cooked diet for cats. Um, For some reason, it was too difficult or there were issues with getting ground up mice. So instead, they got (laughs) ground up rabbits as the whole prey diet. And they fed this to some cats for a while with other cats uh, in the control group on a commercial diet. Unfortunately, it turns out that ground up rabbits are taurine deficient. And several of the cats in the test group died of a nutritional heart disease called uh, taurine deficient cardiomyopathy. So that was a fairly clear demonstration that this naturalistic or appeal to nature fallacy is not something to be trusted. Uh, I think a commercial diet is still the best choice for cats at this point too. Something that I kept seeing on commercials for a while for cat food was this idea that because cats are are uh, obligate carnivores, um, they get their water from eating meat and they don't have a very good thirst reflex and that dry cat food would be bad for them and lead to dehydration and kidney stones. Um, is there any truth to that idea that cats need to consume their water from their food and ergo dry cat food would be bad for them? Yes, it's a, it's a definitely a widespread idea, and, and there is some plausibility to it. Um, cats, uh, historically, you know, from their natural history, have kind of a, a desert orientation. They do concentrate their urine very, very highly, much more so than humans usually do. And um, they do develop chronic kidney disease very commonly when they're older, less commonly you know, bladder or kidney stones and some other urinary tract diseases. So I think it's a good question. I don't think we entirely know yet. It it is appealing to think that feeding a high moisture diet, such as a canned food, um, has some benefits in this regard. And and it is still commonly recommended, particularly for cats with pre-existing kidney disease. I have seen a couple of studies where cats were, were fed either dry diets or canned high moisture diets and given free access to water. And in several of them, there was actually no difference in um, how uh, highly concentrated their urine was in their total water balance. So I I think there's some reason to doubt this idea, Um, but it's the evidence is limited. And I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that a high moisture diet, certainly in cats with established urinary tract disease, um, is a is not a is a fair thing to do, even though we're not one hundred percent sure it'll make a difference. You had mentioned a few at the top of the show, but are there human foods that are toxic for Mister Good Boy and for Little Ms. Whiskers? There are definitely some things that are problematic. Um, the the one I mentioned earlier, xylitol, is is a artificial sweetener that's in a lot of sugarless gums and other products, and that's become a real problem for dogs because those products are ubiquitous, and often people don't realize that the sweetener is in them. Um, and dogs are very inclined to eat sweet things. It's less of a problem problem in cats because they tend to, they don't have much of a sweet tooth. So they tend not to eat things like that. Uh, The one that has uh, gotten a lot of attention, um, obviously that most people know about is chocolate. Uh, The caffeine and theobromine in chocolate is much harder for dogs to metabolize than for humans. And so they tend to have very serious side effects from eating chocolate. Um, So that's definitely an emergency when your your dog gets into your, uh, your Hershey's bar. Again, cats hardly ever do that because they just don't have a sweet tooth. Grapes are an interesting case. Um, Hmm. There are a number of reports of uh, very rapid onset and ultimately fatal kidney failure in dogs eating grapes or raisins. Um, This is a fairly new phenomenon. Uh, It didn't seem to exist before about the 1990s, and nobody has yet figured out what it's about. Uh, Not all dogs have this happen when they eat grapes or raisins, uh, and we haven't identified a particular compound or contaminant or reason for this happening. So we have to warn people that grapes, I certainly wouldn't feed them to your, your dog um, because there's a potential risk there, but we don't know exactly why that is or, or what the susceptibility or factor involved is. There's some talk about garlic and onions. There have been some uh, animal model studies looking at garlic and onions causing a uh, 
some kind of what's called Heinz body anemia or damaging red blood cells. I don't find even dogs tend to eat garlic and onions very often. So you have to go out of your way to feed them a fairly large quantity uh, for that sort of thing to happen. Those are the most common toxicities in terms of foods. Obviously, the, the most common uh, other than that would be marijuana. Uh, we see the marijuana toxicity quite commonly in dogs now that it's uh, legal in a wider range of places. Um, and honestly, by itself, it's, uh, I think, an unpleasant looking experience, but rarely serious or fatal to the dogs. The bigger concern are uh, co-intoxicants. Again, some uh, edibles have chocolate or caffeine or xylitol in them, and those are a bigger problem than the marijuana itself. So CBD, cannabidiol, which is part of cannabis, uh, are there CBD supplements that are targeting uh, pets, and should they be avoided? Uh, they are everywhere, yes. Uh, it is the hot thing these days, and so very many of my clients come in having tried uh, CBD in one form or another for their dogs or for their cats. And in general, the evidence is limited. Um, there are uh, enough studies that I think we can say from a toxicological point of view, it's probably not harmful. It's pretty darn hard to reach a, a dangerous level of, of CBD, partly because it's also not very readily absorbed. The bioavailability is quite low. Um, THC is the is the active component in marijuana that causes most of the unpleasant side effects for dogs. So uh, a purified CBD product that doesn't have uh, very much THC in it is probably not harmful, at least in the short term. We don't have any long-term studies. There are only two clinical studies looking at whether there are any benefits to CBD in dogs. Uh, one was a small study at Colorado State University looking at dogs with arthritis. Um, and there was some suggestion of a benefit above placebo. Um, there are definitely some problems with the study. You know, the dropout rate was 30% and the number of dogs was only about 25 or 30 to begin with. So um, there, there, you know, it's, it's pretty poor evidence, but from a veterinary point of view, it's, uh, it's not bad compared to, you know, the level of evidence we usually get. So there's some potential benefit there in terms of pain control in, a, in an arthritis situation. Um, there was also a study looking at dogs with epilepsy, since CBD has been mm -hmm. uh, approved in one form for uh, humans with a particular type of epilepsy. Um, that was less suggestive of a beneficial effect. A lot of people who are, are advocates for CBD in pets are, have argued that the dose was too low. Um, but again, very small study, very limited numbers, not a dramatic effect size. Um, so I think at this point, we don't know for sure if there are any benefits, and we think there are probably few risks. The one thing I do point out to people is that it is, first of all, not legal. And as a consequence, there's no regulation or quality control. Um, so many of the products available out on the market, when they're spot tested, have nothing in them or have too much or too little of the things <laughs> they're supposed to have in them. So like the supplement market in general, I was going to um, say, not always, yeah. not always getting what you pay for. Yeah. Uh, now, Little Ms. Whiskers uh, has 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 done a really uh, bad thing with my furniture with her claws. I'm I'm thinking of having her declawed against against Chris's wishes. Uh, mm -hmm. Should we be declawing cats? I don't think so. I don't recommend it. I mean, the bottom line is that um, the claws are. Uh, tightly uh, embedded in the, the distal phalanx or the last little bone in the digits. So essentially a declawing is chopping off the tips of your fingers, which is a pretty invasive uh, procedure to do. A little bit, um, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, it can, like any surgical procedure, be done with adequate pain control, but it's primarily a procedure that's done for the convenience of owners. And I don't find that a compelling reason to do something that is, you know, ultimately has some some discomfort and some functional disability associated with it. Cats who are declawed do tend to get arthritis later in life. Um, and it denies them some species typical behavior. As a behavioral biologist, before I became a veterinarian, I was interested in, you know, the behavioral welfare of captive animals, mostly in zoo settings. And we talked a lot about uh, providing opportunities for behaviors that are typically expressed within a species as a measure of welfare. Um, scratching, climbing, those are species typical behavior for cats. And I don't think we should deny them those behaviors without a pretty good reason. So uh, I'm not a fan of declawing. Speaking about behavior in cats, is there is le letting them go outside, is that a net positive, a net negative, or does it not really make a difference? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I do think that there's pretty good evidence that, that going outside uh, is dangerous. Uh, there are disease risks and risks of trauma, hit, being hit by a car, being preyed upon by other animals. Um, I, think, uh, I think that there are health risks to being outdoors. 
And I do think there are health risks to being strictly indoors. Indoor cats are more likely to be obese. They're more likely to have certain kind of urinary tract disorders. I think there are ways to make cats who are indoor only cats um, happy and healthy. Um, but you do have to uh, commit to those. And, uh, and so behavioral enrichment is a big part of that. There's a project called the Indoor Pet Initiative that I think originally started at Ohio State University and, and that has a lot of suggestions for ways to create an environment that is behaviorally rich for an indoor only cat. Um, catios are quite popular and closed areas that allow cats to be outdoors and, and view the outside and interact in a distanced sort of way as we are all doing these days with uh, other animals, but without some of the risks of uh, being run over by a car or, or getting into a fight with another cat and, and getting a disease. So I, I do think in general, your cats are probably better off indoors, but you, you do have to do some things to make that an adequate environment for them. So just like having them play in the backyard with you, uh, in that in that situation, the risks would probably be pretty minimal, though. Sure, sure. Being unsupervised is the main problem. Uh, running away and and being outside of your control. So yeah, if you're in a supervised outdoor environment and and you have a cat who's not likely to run away, I think the risks are relatively low there. All right, uh, lightning round. Uh, just quick questions, quick answers. Um, I've heard of supplements that claim to change your dog's urine pH to avoid uh, dog pee killing the grass, killing the lawn. Uh, any good evidence behind those? No, uh, it's not the pH that actually has the effect on the lawn. It's the nitrogen. You're basically over fertilizing that section of grass. So uh, those supplements aren't going to do anything useful at all. The best thing to do is either designate an area in your yard where your dog can go um, that doesn't have anything you don't want over fertilized. Or if you're really dedicated, you can follow your dog around with a watering can and dilute the urine afterwards. I've read about feline injection site sarcomas. Uh, what are they? How common are they? Should, be afraid, should I be afraid of them? So injection site sarcomas are a very aggressive type of cancer that appears to be more common in cats in places where they have had some sort of injection. Uh, most commonly, these have been associated with vaccinations, particularly feline leukemia and rabies vaccines, but they've also been associated with any other medication that you give injectably, with microchips, with wounds, um, foreign objects. Uh, so, so we're not entirely sure what the pathophysiology is, what triggers these things. Um, one of the more popular theories is that inflammation associated with uh, something that breaks the skin triggers cells to turn into cancer cells and to generate this cancer. Um, the incidence is not very well established. Studies have ranged from maybe one in uh, a thousand cats vaccines to 0.5 or 0.6 in 10,000 cat vaccines. There seem to be some genetic risk factors, so it's more common in some countries than others. And I think we don't have a big handle on it. It's definitely not common. Um, and it is not a reason to avoid necessary vaccinations, but I do think that it has had a salutary effect on the veterinary profession in that we think a little bit more carefully about when we vaccinate, how often we vaccinate, what we vaccinate for. If you have a strictly indoor cat that never leaves your house, it probably doesn't need some of the vaccines that we used to routinely give every single year of its life. And it may be that we can lower the risk of this uh, without raising the risk of infectious disease. So I don't think it's something to be terribly afraid of, but I do think it's something to consider when making a vaccination plan uh, for a cat. Omega-3s, any good evidence in pets? Uh, there are a couple of studies in dogs with atopic derm dermatitis or allergies showing that it reduces the amount of steroid that the owners need to give to control the itching or the symptoms. So um, I think there's some limited evidence that they may have some value in that context. Not much for anything else. Uh, glucosamine, you mentioned earlier. Yeah, pretty pretty complete waste of money and time. <laughs> That's pretty well established. Um, you know, what I, I often use it as an example because in humans, there are dozens of studies involving thousands of people, some of them lasting for years. And in veterinary medicine, we have two clinical trials in dogs involving a total of about 50 dogs, each of which lasted three months. So the evidence is pretty weak and, and not suggestive of a benefit in dogs. But I think this is a case where we're extrapolating from the much larger evidence base in humans, which suggests that it's very unlikely to have any meaningful benefit. Are there any supplements that are useful with infections and bladder issues in pets is a question we were asked. 
Probably not. I think what, what the questioner is probably thinking of is cranberry. There's a tendency to think of cranberry as a supplement that's useful right. in reducing bladder infections. Um, there's not much reason to think that that's true. The cranberry extract might have some effect on certain kinds of fimbriated E. coli. So, you know, there's some plausibility to it, but in general, it hasn't turned out to be very useful. Um, and there's certainly no evidence to suggest that it is in cats or dogs. The other syndrome that I think people might be thinking of is what's called interstitial cystitis. Cats have this very frustrating problem where they develop uh, intense inflammation in their bladder, causes, uh, it looks and acts just like a bladder infection, but there's no infectious component and, and antibiotics aren't helpful. And in female cats, it's a nuisance and they, they pee a lot and maybe dribble a little bloody urine around the house for a week or two and then they get better. The problem is that in male cats, they will sometimes get urinary tract obstructions which can be life-threatening. So there's a huge array of supplements out there and cranberry and glucosamine are among them purported to uh, either treat or reduce the risk of acquiring this problem. Um, there really is no reliable evidence for any of them working. Getting a pet uh, can feel like you're about to get a baby. And as, as you mentioned- And with good reason. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, it's 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 uh, the same kinds of concerns with with vaccination. You know, with, with your kids, uh, th there's a, there's a ton of things you need to know about training them, about uh, house training them, about trimming your dog's nails, and what food to buy, how to make them less anxious, how much exercise you need. Do you do you have book recommendations for soon to be pet parents? I don't have specific books that I recommend. What I often tell people, and, and I would say this is similar to my experience as a parent, is that um, read as much as you reasonably can and take it all with a grain of salt uh, because all of it is just opinion in most cases. Hmm. So I think uh, getting to know your veterinarian and talking with them early on in the pet's life is a really important source of information. Um, but I think you do have to be mindful that you will hear very strident opinions about exactly how you train your dog and, and how you raise your pet. Um, and they're all just that, their opinions. There are a lot of different ways to have a successful outcome. Honestly, what I would suggest people do is think even more about what kind of pet they want to get before they get a pet. Um, particularly with dogs, uh, one of the consequences of breeding dogs so intensively as we have is that different breeds have fairly predictable temperaments. And the kind of pet you want, um, you're more likely to get if you pick a breed that has the temperament you're looking for. You know, if you want a dog to lie around at your feet and, and love you for no reason and not take a lot of your time and energy, Golden Retriever might be a good choice. You know, Border Collie, probably not so much. So um, I think the choice of pet you get is actually probably the first place. And, and that, again, is something where there are a lot of resources out there and I would read widely and then take it all with a grain of salt. But with, with pure breeds, uh, you do run the risk of like significant health issues. Do, would, would you recommend mutts uh, having a more uh, d diverse genetic background? Interestingly, um, it's been really difficult to prove that overall mutts are healthier than purebreds. There are specific diseases that are associated with particular pure breeds. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're concerned about, you know, what risks you might face with a particular breed, you should you should definitely look into that and look into the, the line that you're getting that dog from and how common that is. There are some pretty good screening programs now that help you get a sense of how likely that is to happen. But oddly enough, comparative studies, mostly based on insurance, uh, insured pet populations in Europe, haven't found that overall longevity or overall health is consistently better in mixed breeds than in, uh, in, in, in purebreds. And I think some of that may be because all dogs uh, have been through some genetic bottlenecks and are pretty uh, unvaried in their genetic background, even though the phenotypes, the visible appearance are quite dramatically different. Um, so I, I'm not sure that hybrid vigor necessarily works in dogs. That's been a tough one to prove. Um, I'm a big fan of mutts because I think that they need homes. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I think there are a lot of, of pets out there that, that make wonderful companions um, that haven't been purpose bred. So all of my dogs come from rescue organizations. Um, but I, I think that health, it's hard to prove that health is a reason to do that. Well, Dr. Brennan McKenzie, this has been so informative and, and interesting. Uh, if people want to find you and your work uh, online, where do they go? So as you mentioned, I have a website called theskeptvet.com, which uh, started as a blog, and that's still uh, an active uh, part of my outreach. Um, I do also have associated Facebook and Twitter accounts under SkeptVet. I have a YouTube channel with just a handful of videos, so I'm working on on becoming more photogenic uh, and, <laughs> and more modern and, and youthful and hip in <laughs> making videos, but I'm not very good at that yet. Um, you should I get do on TikTok. TikTok. That's, that's, yeah. where, that's where the kids are. 
<laughs> that's where the kids are. I think I've missed that boat. Um, I do also have uh, a book called Placebos for Pets, The Truth About Alternative Medicine in Animals, which I think uh, offers a lot of, of uh, interesting information about uh, different kinds of therapies and a general approach to when you hear something that you are recommended to try for your dog, uh, how do you assess whether it makes sense or is worth trying or not? So those are all ways that people can get a hold of me. If you want to be successful on YouTube, I recommend uh, you don't put yourself in front of the camera, you put one of your dogs and you give them peanut butter beforehand so it looks like they're talking, and then you do the voiceover. Uh, Excellent idea. I'm see? going to have to see how Brody goes along with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brennan, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, thank you. That was, was, was very, uh, very educational. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And that's the end of our show this month. 